Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena for yet more DIY fun. This week we're going to start out by taking a quick look at Athena's AC and DC systems and then we're going to move on to building a pressurized water system from scratch. Earlier this week I finally got Athena's 24 volt battery up and running. This is 7 point something kilowatt hours worth of lithium. It's well, a little bit of a complicated setup, so there is a lot of things I could talk about here. This is going to be more of an introduction, and then later in the fall, I'll make a more detailed, dedicated video. Our system is based around eight of these 300 amp hour Winston cells. These are lithium iron phosphate cells. That's a very safe chemistry. And if you crack open a battery, a lithium battery from one of the big manufacturers like Mastervolt or Victor Energy, inside of that battery, you are going to find yellow Winston cells, just like these ones. To not in any way anger or irritate the angry pixies that are hiding inside of these yellow boxes, and there are quite a few of them in there, we have these connected up to a BMS. That's that black box you can see there. The purpose of the BMS is to protect the cells and to make sure that they're all nice and balanced and cozy. Here aboard Athena, we have gone with a BMS from a European company called REC. We'll get back to them a little bit later in the video. Um, this is an extra one because apparently I am not able to read a manual, so I managed to fry this one when I was connecting it to the cells. Hopefully we can get this little guy repaired and carry him as a spare. Now if you want to use this BMS just be aware that they start the connections on this connector here from the right hand side and then going to the left. So at the far right hand side here is going to be cell 1, then cell 2, cell 3, cell 4. I started from the left hand side going towards the right and uh, well, that's what fried the thing. In all fairness to REC, their manual is actually not bad, it's just they have a list of the pinout for this connector and I just assumed that it started from the left hand side going towards the right. Further down in the manual there is a picture of this thing where you can see that it's the other way around, but by the time I got down there I wasn't really looking at the order of the connection because I thought I'd already figured that out. So yeah, the manual is not horrible, I'm just a giant dum-dum. Why did I choose to go with this specific BMS? Well for one, REC has a really good reputation for providing support, and that is very important to me. And also they have a very spiffy integration with Victron gear, you might be able to see some of the blue boxes down there in the background. And also they integrate to an external regulator for an alternator from a company called Wakespeed. This is that last product. This is essentially a Wakespeed controller, but just in a different packaging with a few additional features. But uh, we'll uh, get back to this guy a little bit later. This is a Serbo GX box from Victron Energy. This gray cable over here connects to the BMS. This blue one connects to the Quattro inverter charger. And the blue one next to that connects to a little remote panel at the nav station. I've temporarily got the front panels off of these two boxes. The one on the right is the inverter charger. The one on the left is the isolation transformer. The isolation transformer makes sure we don't have any issues with galvanic corrosion and it'll also step 115 volts up to 230 when we get to the US. Connecting the BMS back there to the rest of the system over CAN bus has some really cool benefits. For one, the BMS is going to show up in the Victron system as a battery monitor that's going to help regulate the charging and also it helps us avoid one of the classic alternator traps when switching to lithium. Pardon the mess down here, I haven't tidied this up yet, but down here you see a 500 amp contactor, the BMS has the ability to just cut this connection anytime it sees fit. The BMS is not going to do that on a daily basis, but it can do it for a number of reasons, for instance over voltage, under voltage, temperature, so there's a very real chance that that is going to happen while you're charging the batteries with the alternator. If that happens, there is a very real chance that you're going to end up killing your alternator, which kind of sucks. There's a handful of ways of getting around that problem, but one of them is to use an external regulator like this guy, the uh, wake speed in disguise. As you can see, I haven't hooked this guy up yet. I'm waiting for some cables, but hopefully we can get to that next week. Now, in the event that the BMS decides to shut down the system, this guy will be notified so that he can stop the charging from the alternator before that happens. Like I mentioned, there are more than one way of handling this problem. This is the most high-tech solution. You can do a bunch of other stuff, but it's something you should be aware of if you switch to lithium, because the BMS does have the ability to cut that connection at any time that sees fit. 
and it would really suck to kill an expensive high output alternator. Back to the current electrical setup here aboard Athena. Up here is a little color touch display that's connected to the Serbo GX box. And then down here is a remote control panel that's connected to the inverter charger. With this little knob down here, we can set a current limit for how much we want to draw off of shore power. Up here on the color display, we can get an indication of what the system is up to. We can see that energy is flowing into the battery and that we've got some AC loads on, about 60 watts, so not a lot. The current limit is currently set to 13 amps. So if we're gonna be drawing more than that, then the power assist feature is gonna kick in and we can actually demonstrate that. I'm going to turn on some heavy loads on the AC side here. And at some point we're gonna hit that 13 amp limit and then you'll be able to see energy start flowing from the battery to the AC side instead of us charging the battery. So yeah, this is gonna get a little bit loud. This is a heat gun. As you can see, it's drawing 1300 watts, but if you also turn on the vacuum, now we're drawing about 3000 watts. And as you can see, the power assist feature is working. There are some scenarios if your boat have high AC loads that this is a very useful feature. Like for instance, here aboard Athena, we have induction cooktop and an electric oven, washer, dryer, a bunch of other stuff. And in the event that we are in a marina where we can't get quite enough juice from a dodgy shore power connection, we can use the power assist feature. Or also if we wanna run more than our four kilowatt genset can handle, well, then we can also use the power assist feature in combination with that. Of course, we can only use the power assist feature on the Quattro for as long as we've got juice in the batteries. And we've got five kilowatt hours worth of usable energy. So hopefully that'll be enough for us. But there are some other cool features about the Quattro. Like for instance, it has two AC inputs. So one is going to be shore power, the other is going to be the generator, but yeah, that's going to be more for a later video. That should give you guys a quick overview of the electrical systems here aboard Athena. There are plenty more details to go into, like for instance, the entire 12 volt side, but that's all gonna be for a later video. For now, I don't think we need to access the aft end of the aft cabin anymore this week. So let's get all of this stuff shoved in there so we can start working on the pressurized water system. The next day we got started on the pressurized water system. The first step was to run the blue and the red tube for the cold and hot water a somewhat time consuming job, but fortunately I still had a little bit of room in the holes I made for running cables when I rebuilt the interior. We also mounted supports for the pump and the accumulator tank as these will be installed on a foam cord bulkhead. For ease of installation, we're gonna be using Whale's Quick Connect fittings. You guys will see these in a little bit more detail in just a second. Our 200 liter stainless steel water tank is already installed and connected, but that's the only thing I've prepped. Everything else we need for the system is over here on the kitchen island. There's a bunch of stuff here on the table, but let's start at this end. This is the water heater. It has a coil inside of it for the hydronic heating setup. We were gonna use a heat exchanger, but I've decided to swap it out with this guy, just so we're also able to heat water using electricity. Next to the water heater is buried a thermostatic mixing valve. We'll be installing this on the water heater in just a second. And then we get into some fittings. Whale offers a ton of different quick connect fittings. These are just a very small sample. I'm guessing these are some of the most commonly used ones. The name quick connect fittings is not misleading because all you do is just simply shove the tube in there and that's it, you're done. There's no Teflon tape or tightening anything. It's just shoving it in there and that is it. And to release the thing again, you push down on this little light gray ring and then you just pull out the tube. There's no difference between the red and the blue tube besides the color. You might have seen us shove some of the red tube here inside of some of this insulating sleeve. That's simply just so that the hot water doesn't get icy cold before it reaches the shower or the faucets. You might be wondering what's up with this weird colored tube here. This is regular 15 millimeter household PEX. We have some of this stuff running below the cabin sole between the head and the galley. And I just wanted to see if we could use these quick connect fittings with that. And so far, you know, it seems like a nice snug fit, but uh, we'll see if it leaks. As you might have caught a glimpse of between the tank and the PEX tube, we had some of this regular hose here. That's just to make it a nice flexible connection. Of course, to connect this to this, we need some kind of fitting. There are two fittings here that might look kind of similar. There's this guy with a half inch thread on there, and then there's this guy with a 13 millimeter hose barb. And of course the hose barb is what we need to connect to this guy. The non-business end of this fitting is identical on the two. That's because this end is supposed to slide into, for instance, one of these little guys. So it's just a matter of 
smooshing it in there, and that's it. You're done. Of course, we would need a hose clamp around this blue hose here to make it nice and tight on the hose bar, but other than that, it's pretty freaking easy to combine these things in all kinds of ways. Instead of going into one of these straight doodads, we could go into a 90 degree one, or a T, or one of these valvey thingies. And like I said, this is only a very small selection of the options that are available. So yeah, this is a very flexible system. For instance, there is another way to go to a half inch thread. That would be something like this guy. Or if we need a female thread, well, then there's one of these guys. I think that's enough about fittings for now. Although I am really drawn to these things. It's kind of like Legos in a sense, but uh, yeah, let's move on to the other stuff here. To create pressure in the system so that when we open a tab, water comes out, we've got one of these guys. It's an AquaJet Flowmaster VPS 5.0. Now that sounds like a whole lot, but this is just a five chamber positive displacement diaphragm pump. These are very common for pressurized water systems. I don't know if this is a particularly good or particularly bad one. I read all the reviews I could find online and they seem to be generally positive. So I have high hopes, especially because this thing was around 450 bucks, which seems a little expensive, but fingers crossed. Next to the Flowmaster 5.0 is this little red pill. This is the accumulator tank. If I'm not mistaken, there's a rubber membrane in here. This fills with water, accumulates pressure, so that if we just pull out a little bit of water from a tab, the pump is not necessarily gonna turn on, meaning this will save the pump from cycling on and off a bunch of times. And uh, yeah, that should hopefully extend the service life of the pump. And then last but certainly not least, over here we've got a tiny little water filter. This is just for the tab in the galley. You can get a bunch of different types of these inserts here. This is mainly just to get something in there for now. The tank is brand new and the water here is great so we won't have any bad taste or odors. But in case you do, putting in one of these filters could be one prong in your attack on that situation. The first thing I did was to install the thermostatic mixing valve on the water heater. This makes us a little bit of cold water in with the hot water from the water heater to make sure it's a constant and safe temperature. Instead of using regular Teflon tape, I used Loctite 55. I've never tried it before, but it was pretty nice to work with. The water heater is going to be installed in the cockpit locker, but it started pouring down, so I got started on the plumbing underneath the sink in the head instead. The quick connect fittings are easy to work with, and with the help of a few 90 degree fittings, it turned out pretty spiffy looking. The rain stopped, so it was back to the water heater in the delightfully cramped cockpit locker. I need to modify this a tiny bit next week, but more on that a little bit later in the video. With the supports in place, Ava tightened the nuts inside of the technical compartment. Then it was on to the pump and the accumulator tank, both mounted inside of the poop tank compartment. As our last deeds of the day, we ran cables for the 12 volt side of the DC setup, 24 volts for the Flowmaster pump, and finally we filled the water tank with 200 liters of delicious Skiva water. All that's left to do now is the final little bit of wiring to get the pump connected up to 24 volts. When we get to the UK, I am going to have to do a little bit of tidying up and cable management in here, but uh, it shouldn't be too bad because I've been fairly careful about labeling everything. Fingers crossed. After fixing a few leaks and getting a little bit of air out of the system, we now have ah, pressurized water. After moving aboard Oblix six years ago, this is the first time I've had pressurized water. What a sweet, sweet luxury. The pressurized water system is not finished yet. I forgot to order the 38 millimeter hose we'll need for the deck fill. We have to blind off the connection for the future water maker and we have to connect a vent. Also, I haven't connected the mixer for the shower yet in here because next week we're gonna be installing some vents in there and it would be silly to install all of this and the mixer just to pull it down a few days later. So yeah, that's for next week. Out here in the cockpit locker where the water heater is installed, I wanna modify this a little bit, come off with some 90s there to have this be a little bit more compact because right now these hoses are protruding out way too far into this. 
So I can't really claim that the pressurized water system is 100% finished, but it is at least working. And there is something else we can finish before we have to end this video. You guys caught a glimpse of the 24 volt system in the beginning of this video. We also have a 12 volt system here aboard the boat, but right now it's a little jerry-rigged. It consists of this old lead acid battery and that AC to DC charger. We need a way of charging the 12 volt side from the 24 volt side because that's where the high output alternator is connected, that's where the inverter charger is connected, so that's where we're going to get all our juice from. Enter stage left, this Orion TR Smart Charger. There are a bunch of different models of this guy available. There are isolated and non-isolated versions. This is the isolated version, just to be sure in case we need that feature later. But as you can see, this is the 24 to 12 volt version. This is capable of operating in two separate modes. It can either be a charger or it can be a power supply with a steady voltage. You switch between the two using an app, and that's the same app you use for that little AC charger I showed you a second ago. As per the instructions, we need to disconnect the remote on off before we power this thing up to get it into charger mode. Why am I going to be putting this into charger mode? Why not just run it in power supply mode? Well, this thing is only 20 amps and although right now we don't have a lot of heavy loads on the 12 volt side, we might at some point in the future. And it'd be nice to use this to charge a battery and then we can use the battery as kind of a buffer and pull a lot more than 20 amps out of that. Also, it'll be nice to have a little bit of redundancy on the 12 volt side because we have some critical information infrastructure there. We have the NMEA 2000 backbone, we have the VHF radio, we have some nav lights, stuff like that. And in case this thing kicks the bucket, well, the 12 volt battery is still going to work and we'll still be able to charge that using our inverter and the AC charger. So yeah, there's a little bit of a redundancy built in this way. I connected the DC-DC charger as per the instructions and I've opened up the app. You can see it. And if we click it, we should be able to change it into charger mode instead of power supply mode. And there we go, as you can see, it is now charging. While that's at it, I chucked one of Victron's smart shunts in there. It's requiring a software update, so let's do that. Besides being Bluetooth enabled, the smart shunt will also connect to the servo box with one of these VE direct cables. That means we can get the information up here on our little display. But it's pretty hard for us to get access to the aft cabin right now, so this will have to wait. I've ordered a slightly longer VE direct cable, which I think we need. And also, I better wait until some of this stuff has migrated out of the aft cabin. We're out of shooting time for this week, but before we end the video, let's update the board. So there are four tasks we can close. Mm -hmm. There is the 12 volt system. There is check that gear accelerator cable are secure on the D240. Mm -hmm. You can also close secure water tank. And then we have the pressurized water. Ooh, ooh. Oh, I guess there's actually more than four because we can also close hook up the water tank. Yeah. And water heater. We might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Let's just move the pressurized water task back into the doing column because I do have to make those small changes I told you about. But there are some tasks here that we can close. The big one is of course hook up and configure and test the BMS that is done. And also the other big one is sell the car. It sold a couple of days ago. This is what the board looks like now. Plenty of tasks in the done column. Still some ongoing ones. But a lot of those are started, so yeah, I expect to see a lot of progress over the next couple of weeks. Progress as in done, because we got to get out of Skiva. Yep, we only have about a month and a week or so left yep. on Ava's Schengen clock, then she's mm -hmm. got to be out of Schengen. And uh, we are coming up on a little bit of a situation, because if we don't get out of Denmark by the end of August, I don't think we're going to go across the North Sea. Then we're probably going to change our route to go down the east coast of Denmark through mm -hmm. the Kiel Canal and then across the English Channel instead. Either way, we desperately need to get out of Schengen pretty soon. And with fingers crossed, we're going to end this week's video here. We hope to see all you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See you.